Lithuania. Uh, Andrews, can you say hello, hi, everyone? Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Andrews. Then I have uh, an uh, forward coordinator uh, of the Neurotech at Uborn, leader of the DAAD UN from uh, 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 specialization is recognition of and SETs um, from Germany. Anna, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Hello, Anna. Thank you. Next uh, on the list, I have Bozidar Grigic. I don't know if you can say that uh, on, on that way, but I tried. Head of the Higher Education Unit from Erasmus Plus and the National Agency from Slovenia. Bozidar. Hello, everyone. Warm greetings from Slovenia. Hello. Then I have a name that I very uh, comfortable spelling because it's Portuguese. Gustavo Rosa is the <laughs> from the Higher Education Unit Erasmus Plus National Agency from Portugal. Uh, Gustavo. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we have Katarina Sommer, Head of International Student Affairs from the University of Siegen from Germany. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you, Katarina. Next, uh, uh, colleague Portuguese, Maria Teresa Restivo from the Administration Board of A3ES, National Body of Certification of Higher Education in Portugal. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be with you, uh, with you all, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Then we have uh, Thomas Seeger, Vice Dean for Quality and International Affairs from the University of Siegen, Germany. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And on the panel is now presented, and I'm going to start the, uh, promoting this debate. My, my suggestion is that I'm going to place a question for each one um, and I, I'm going to ask you that everyone can, can answer that first question and then we'll see. Uh, we'll try to, to have a dialectic and a dynamic debate. So my first question for all the panel is that uh, I would like to hear your opinion about how is virtual and blended mobility accepted recognized by both the internal students, academics, academics, researchers, uh, administration staff, and external stakeholders, employers, society, communities, and so on in your country. Um, please, Andrews, if you can start. Thank you for uh, a good question. Uh, I think that if we talk about uh, our communities, if they recognize uh, blended or virtual mobility or not, um, the picture is quite uh, spotty, I would say, is that we don't have a consensus if it's uh, you know, an actual mobility, I would say. And we do have some uh, skeptics, but uh, if we look back to maybe like three, five years ago, uh, the number of people believing that blended mobility is just as good as full on physical mobility or even, um, you know, uh, digital mobility as well uh, is growing steadily. Uh, on the national level, uh, regarding laws, we had to improvise due to COVID, uh, as I believe many countries did. Uh, so I would not say that we are in a situation where we have a complete understanding of uh, acceptance of these different levels of mobility, but we did make quite a few steps to make it more flexible and more acceptable uh, through uh, for like statistical reasons and for accepting mobility uh, reports from institutions uh, and such. Uh, we did work with our Erasmus agency a lot on this issue on the first month of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic because we thought it's going to be uh, you know, quite important <laughs> to solve. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Uh, can we have your opinion, Anna, please? Yes, sure. So um, perhaps because that's my background from a practical experience, I was a departmental coordinator, so I might say more about the student's perspective. And I think there it's, it's a great opportunity to do something quickly, but it, um, and it's accepted in the sense it's 
But it's, I think it's, the difference to physical mobility would be that the different motives are behind it. Phys physical mobility is more about cultural experience, of course, also the academic experience. But for the students, it's often more about the cultural experience, whereas with the virtual mobility, it shifts to be more about the academics experience and academic exchange. So in this sense, it's accepted, but it then has different motives and different motivations why you do it. Okay, Anna, thank you. Uh, Bozidar, can we have now your opinion, please? Yes, thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that I think that a main weakness of virtual brand mobilities is actually, um, as for many reasons, uh, COVID-19 pandemics. And I think I will agree here with uh, what Anna already said is because um, all of a sudden virtual mobility became a substitute for physical mobility. So students and academic staff that wanted and was prepared to go on mobility, to visit another country, to experience another culture, to meet new people, partners in person, to feel atmosphere at the hosting institutions. Instead of going physically, they had to do the virtual exchange instead from their room, office, apartment. So uh, when they mostly listened to lectures on the screen or participated in the online meeting without uh, any of uh, extra curricular activities, no new cuisine, uh, no after meeting networking drinks, no cultural activities, etc. Um, so therefore, uh, it is not really surprising that the results of the survey that was done among virtual participants show that they would prefer physical activities, that most of them miss the contact with their peers, the real so-called real experience of international mobility. Um, when something is introduced in such rapid manner and without real options, uh, the usual first reaction of us all to new things and changes is negative. So the main message of majority of participants was that virtual mobility cannot and should not substitute the physical mobility. And this is actually the first point that I would like to highlight. Virtual or even better, blended mobility was not introduced to new Erasmus program or to international, internationalization activities in such to replace the physical mobility. After over 30 years of the program and countless research has done, we know all the results and impact the physical mobility brings. brings. But moreover, um, the blended mobility is here to improve the internationalization processes of higher education institutions with better inclusion of more students and staff in the program. So this is my second point, actually, and this is where I agree with Anna, the blended mobility is targeting different people, not that those that are already convinced that they want to go on exchange on a physical mobility because they will go and they don't want the virtual mobility, but rather is targeting students and staff that for some personal reasons or circumstances cannot go on a long-term physical mobility. And for them, this type of activity could be interesting. Um, just to maybe point out also, of course, we must not forget on the quality of these activities. This cannot be just simply lectures delivered online, but carefully thought out uh, interactive, interactive activities that are including also networking and culture parts. Um, and maybe just to also throw out this bone, every new thing is scary and seems unnecessary and possible and so on. But we must remember even internationalization, something that nowadays is very normal, not just normal, but crucial priority area of strategy of every higher education institution. It wasn't always like that. And I believe that the same is going to happen with virtual blended activities or mobilities. They are here, they are reality, they are future. Now it only depends how long we will need to implement them and how smart we will be in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Bozida. For your opinion now gustavo can we, we hear you please yes well from the erasmus from an erasmus perspective after this uh, brilliant intervention from my colleague bozidar I, I wouldn't have much <laughs> to add from the <laughs> from the erasmus point of view but uh, well i i fully support what bozidar uh, has just said uh, the the program has been forced as society in general to be able to adapt quickly to this new reality coming from the pandemic we are where we are still living so the introduction of uh, virtual or mainly blended uh, activities have been uh, have been have been considered as crucial 
And uh, as Bozidar said, uh, they are crucial. They allow more people to participate within the program. So this means more inclusion in access to the Erasmus experience, but still uh, it shall be considered as a, well, as, as a part of the experience uh, in general. So the physical mobility, and we must not forget which is the, which one is the main aim of the Erasmus program. And it is, of course, contributing to a better and a more uh, strong and united uh, European Union. Uh, so based on that, the, the physical mobility cannot be replaced. However, the, the virtual and blended mobility have been uh, well increasingly uh, implemented. And still, we do not have a, a complete uh, um, uh, we, we still do not have a complete, uh, a, a, well, we have a, a, a considerable uh, part of, of students that, uh, that they opt not to, uh, to accept the virtual experience still, but this is a quite recent event. So we uh, expect uh, this, uh, this kind of experience to become more or less uh, regular and uh, normal in the future. Still, uh, within this new phase of the program, well, we, we do have the, the, the inclusion of virtual activities as, as compulsory. Well, I could give uh, here several examples, but uh, already uh, Bozidar mentioned some of them, but mainly for blended intensive programs, for instance, we have a, a virtual component, which is compulsory. Still, we will have a compulsory uh, virtual experience for people coming from a disadvantaged background, if, if they intend to go on a short term mobility, for instance. So we are uh, gradually introducing the virtual experience as a part of the program. But the, the main conclusion that I would like to share is that still the virtual will never, uh, well, substitute the, 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 the physical experience. So the, the question of, of being or not accepted is, I believe, a, a matter of time. But that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gustavo. Katerina, can we hear you please now? Yes, thank you. Um, me being from an international office, it's obvious that I can most easily take the perspective of students and I can only echo what my previous uh, speakers have already said, that we have a lot of students that are skeptical about the concept. I think that it takes further promotion and also convincing them of the added benefits of virtual exchange, virtual mobility because we do have a lot that, as uh, Bojida, for instance, mentioned, that have prepared for the physical stay, and then suddenly we're not willing to engage in the virtual mobility. But we are quite hopeful because we have experience with those that have actually dared to go on this adventure of virtual mobility throughout the pandemic. And they have come back with quite positive experiences. So we're hoping that we can convince these students to act as pioneers and talk to their peers and convince them of the benefit that such a concept will have. And generally, I also think it is the role of an international office to also engage with the academic staff, but also within the administration to convince the various stakeholders of the advantages such a program will have, because widening participation is a big issue for international offices. If you look at physical mobility, you could even say that it is some sort of elite phenomenon. You know, only a small percentage of students actually does go on to physical mobility and virtual mobility would really help reach the vast majority of students. So we're hoping that it will have a bright future, but we also believe that both types of mobili mobility, the virtual and the phys physical will coexist. Okay, Katrina, thank you. Now, can we hear Maria Teresa, if you please? Being one of the, the last, uh, it's, it's comfortable because many things were said already, but, but uh, I think the, the main points were already uh, pointed out, in fact. Um, one of the things that I, I, I need to recognize is everyone has to accept some kind of um, directions, uh, not only because we have COVID now. I hope that COVID will go as many other things and we'll have others possibly, but 
especially because we were all forced to to use some tools. Uh, some of us were used to, but others no. And uh, uh, we are also forgetting that many people, many teachers do not know how to use tools, the tools correctly. And we also need to understand that these, these uh, fantastic uh, uh, explosion of uh, the digital world uh, also came, I also brought some signs of the digital divide. So uh, in any case, we need to look at the Erasmus Plus guide, which I have been doing in order to, to be updated with uh, the present uh, position of the Europe. And uh, what I see mostly is the blended uh, mobility is constantly re referred uh, for all types of cycles, study cycles. And so uh, what uh, our colleague said before me was that, uh, yes, we, we will see the physical and the virtual. Yes, and both com combined will be the blended uh, mobility. So I think <clears throat> that uh, we need to, to look at it. And if, if we are all on the same boat, <laughs> we have to recognize that the blended mobility uh, came to stay, not only imposed by the, 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 this moment, but also because it showed us that we can easily uh, do some, some activities and we can do them really. So uh, now what can you ask me about the position of the, uh, the agency in Portugal? Um, well, I think that at this point, uh, having to consider that it is here and it is recognized by the European Union and uh, we know what this means. So HES can show its own concern with general aspects when assess assessing study programs. And when we will be assessing study programs, of course, in, in the future, we will try to maintain those items like quality of teaching staff, clear updated methodologies, where the student-centered uh, education plays uh, the role, uh, clear evidence of teaching staff able to conduct distance education in order to be effective on the virtual parts of it, and clear evidence that teachers are available for a synchronous and synchronous tutor activity, which is a must as well. And so this is the point for the HEAS uh, being concerned in looking at, but uh, I, don't, I do not have doubts that we have blended uh, learning situation and so blended learning mobility. And this could lead to many others, uh, other, uh, interesting uh, features that maybe I can refer later on in another topic. Okay, thank you, Maria Teresa. And uh, at last, please, uh, Thomas, it's your turn. So can I hear you? Yes, great, thank you. Thank so you. I'm the last one. A lot of things have been uh, said already and mentioned. And uh, uh, maybe I want to add a few things. Uh, right now, it's it's very easy to to promote virtual or blended mobility. We have now the pandemic situation. Physical mobility is, is a little bit difficult, but uh, we should show the university and all other institutions should show the advantages of blended or virtual mobility. Because in future, it should not be a way that, that, that it's either physical mobility or blended uh, or virtual mobility. It should be an end. And this is very important. Uh, and uh, the students will do this if they will see the advantages. For example, that they can take courses at other universities, just courses, not a complete semester, but courses which they don't have at their own university, but which may, might be very useful for a bachelor or master thesis. So these advantages we should promote and we should show uh, very clearly in order to have a, a, a good um, promotion of virtual and blended mobility 
after the pandemic has gone. And I think that is very important from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you to, to all of the, the, the members of the panel for this first intervention. Very, very interesting. I, I was thinking, uh, in fact, that uh, it is common in, in every intervention that there are uh, a lot of benefits from the implementation of the virtual and blended mobility teaching. But there are also some barriers, and those barriers uh, are linked to the specific laws of the country, to other cultural uh, issues. So the, the question that I would like to, to place here for the panel, and now you feel free to, to, to intervene uh, if, if, you, if you want, of course, is that, uh, in fact, what are the more um, evident barriers that we are uh, feeling in your specific countries? So please, if anyone can uh, answer this question. I can tell a bit more about the so really the implementation of problems we have here in Germany and I think the main problem is just one of one of the administrative status so what if there is especially if it's only for example one course so for six ECTS what is the student what is uh, uh, what kind of student is it, and is it a full student? Is he does he have to be enrolled? And at the Germany at the moment, or at least in NIV, uh, where I am, yes, they have to be enrolled and things like that. So that's more like the legal status. Do we need something like a visiting student? Do we need another status? Like we have a visiting student status, or we have in one of our uh, uh, Lander in uh, Germany, we have now a European stu student status, especially, so they changed the law already, mm -hmm. um, that there is a specific status. If you're a student of a European university network, mm -hmm. you have the right to study, I think it's nine weeks or something per semester at a partner university without being enrolled there. So th these are uh, Problems, I think, and the other thing is often is really just more the technical aspects, how to give access to the digital infrastructure, um, how so that it's easy for the students and easy for the administration, and but also secure and uh, and um, and um, both secure in, in terms of privacy, but also of IT security. So that I would say is the main uh, uh, challenges we see here in Germany, especially for the different European university networks. Okay, Anna, thank you. I'm, I believe that you are going to say something, Andrews. No. I can only second what Anna mentioned. One of our main barriers is that uh, we had trouble defining uh, legally in our laws, um, I would say redefining mobility, because for quite a long time only physical mobility was accepted uh, through all of our programs, including national and uh, Erasmus funded. Um, so we had to look at that at first. And um, at the moment we have a, a makeshift decision. Uh, if we come back to our last discussion, we know that it's only uh, being set up for the period of uh, the COVID pandemic crisis, and we'll have to revisit this issue. So I think that um, in our system, uh, many of the issues, especially administrative and legal, have been solved in a way, but the feeling is, is that it's, you know, just for now, it's... it's uh, uh, a very limited model in time. And we'll have to return to most of this model that we've created once again, when things are a little bit calmer. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Uh, Bozidar, can you, can you uh, share with us the point of view that you have uh, in uh, Slovenia? Yes, thank you, gladly. Um, well, what I can say is I believe that uh, maybe for students, this isn't really such a big problem. O of course, there might be some legal issues or uh, technical or whatsoever, but um, 
considering delivering the, the content twice, um, and I'm not saying that this is a, considered a good case practice, but you know, it was showed that during uh, pandemic or quarantine, of course, there was distance learning. So even at home universities, they had to follow the lectures online. So basically, even when they did the, the virtual mobility, they were following as the, the students at, at uh, this, um, let's say, uh, hosting university um, uh, in the same way. So the distance learning was done. Um, and, and in Slovenia, like we, we had quite few students that decided to do the virtual mobility. But if we move and look at the staff, so academic staff, uh, we had basically zero virtual mobilities during, during this past two years. Um, and, and, and I think this will be quite bigger challenge actually in future um, to, to motivate uh, academic staff to also do virtual mobilities. Uh, one is of course the workload, which in their words doubles because they're still present at their home university. They do their lectures that they have to do or their activities that they're doing researchers and so on. Plus they're doing online activities because they are on mobility, right? But so in, in if they would be on physical mobility, they would be absent from work. So they wouldn't be doing those these, these double workload. And, and the other part is now speaking from Erasmus perspective is that virtual mobility is not financed, right? Um, so this is a, another maybe uh, uh, issue or uh, let's say barrier that, that can be perceived. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bozida. Um, Gustavo, can you, can you share with us our uh, view of the, those barriers here in Portugal? Yes, of course. Well, from uh, from our perspective, I would say that uh, well, this this rapid change we have tra this transition from physical to virtual only allowed us to simply uh, make a, a kind of an echo of a physical uh, uh, classroom, for instance, and we just transferred it to a virtual uh, format. So this means that I believe that there is some lack of confidence in terms of, 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 of the process itself, as well as concerning, for, for instance, the, the evaluation moments. And I truly believe that these are probably what, this is one of the main barriers we are finding uh, because the teachers, they, they can be eventually, they, they, they can be um, available to, to have uh, uh, um, a, a distance uh, a distance class or a, a distance uh, to allow the students to to have a, a distance um, experience in terms of learning but when it comes to for instance evaluation i believe that this is not uh, still uh, well well defined and i believe this this, this takes time of course we need time uh, but uh, uh, I would say these are, this is one of the main barriers and, and probably the lack of digital resources and, and, and infrastructures, as Anna was saying, I believe, uh, still this is a, a kind of, a, well, an obstacle to, to allow us to have uh, a more um, transparent and, uh, and, and uh, with the more quality assurance uh, virtual mobility activities. So, so this is... Uh, what I would like to have, that's it. Okay, Gustavo, thank you. I don't know if anyone can add something about these ideas of the barriers. Uh, Thomas, please. Raise my, my hand. Uh, Nuno had put in a, a nice question into the chat. Thank you, Nuno. It's exactly a question I had some, some time ago. Uh, at our university, how many ECTS a student can achieve due to mobility at other universities. So if it's limited to a certain amount, the student will probably use this for uh, physical mobility because that might be more interesting for the students. If it's limited to 30 ECTS, it's one semester. So uh, the student will go to another university for one semester. If it's more, uh, then he could probably also uh, put in virtual mobility and courses at other universities. But on the other hand, if this is, these are too many courses, how long a, a degree will count as a degree of a certain university if the student 
takes 90% of courses at other universities. So what is the upper limit? That's also, uh, of course, a question, uh, more a detailed question, but for a student, it's a very important question. I just want to mention this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Anyone? May no? I just- Yes, Maria Teresa, please, please. Two or three things. In fact, they have been around, so I think that I, and I was writing them here. So I think that I'm just collecting uh, and uh, I think that the definition of the institutions, it's the first thing for the, the present situation, I mean, considering new ways of mobility. So the uh, institutions have to define. Uh, and I know that they are trying to define, but there are not very well defined positions. And so they are just studying the, the process then we need to have qualified teachers, okay? It's not only delivering lessons uh, and um, for the virtual component, of course. Then we have to, to be very clear about the assessment, which is the process, the assessment process of students. How can you do it in a serious way? And uh, finally, I think that the physical part is always for students something that we cannot substitute. So I believe, strongly believe on the mix of uh, physical and blended uh, and uh, with a lot of positive things, but I don't believe really in the virtual one. However, I think that in very specific cases, maybe virtual one could be something to consider. But I think we have to get one step each time. And now, from my point of view, it's much better, much easier to go through the blended part of it and then to think about the totally virtual one. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Catherine, I don't know if you want to add anything about this uh, question of the barriers. Well, I think a lot of subjects have already been touched upon by the previous speakers. I think in the German case, uh, the legal issues might be a bit more complex because Germany has 16 federal states and they each have a law governing higher education and universities. And enrollment is also always connected to the issue of health insurance, which would then be a national law that would also need to be adapted. So I think there's a lot of legalese that would need to be fixed. But on the other hand, I believe that universities could have workarounds. There is a status of, of or a visiting student status that has been used within Germany. So you can be enrolled at two different universities in Germany. Uh, the literal translation would actually be second secondary listener. So you're enrolled at a second university. So this might be a workaround that could be utilized to some extent. And then on the other hand, I also think the program needs a lot of promotion in terms of integration into the curriculum. I think uh, Maria Teresa was uh, focusing on this, that the teaching staff also needs to learn how to deal with these new incentives and these new modes of teaching. Because while the pandemic certainly has garnered enough momentum about online teaching, you also have these notions of like Zoom fatigue or, you know, you're being tired of being, of constantly being in a video conference. So teaching staff has to come up with innovative ways how to deliver virtual mobility or virtual exchange. So I think it is a combination of various factors. Okay, Katrina, thank you. But uh, there is also the, the other side of the moon, the brilliant, brilliant side of the moon and the, the, the benefits that this virtual and blended mobility can provide to both the internal and external stakeholders. So I'm going to ask you if you can share with us uh, the top three of those benefits that you find that you find in your in your uh, countries for this virtual and blended mobility. Top three, please. Very assertive question, and uh, I would like a very assertive answer also. Three, top three. Anyone? Top three uh, benefits. Top three benefits. Um, who is going to start? 
please, please, Maria Teresa. Okay, so <clears throat> I have been thinking a little bit about that because it was the, the, the good thing of this seminar. Um, and um, I think that uh, many of the um, issues that have been pointed out as uh, ways of solving the brain, uh, brain drain that has been happening in Europe, namely from east to west and from south to north. And we know why. And in particular, uh, all my colleagues from Portugal know very well that even uh, we had some so gov government uh, people saying to our uh, young people a few years ago that uh, we had no conditions, so go away. And so we lost a lot of the, the most well prepared young people we had. And uh, uh, looking at the, the, uh, uh, the perspectives that we can use in order, Europe can use in order to uh, balance all of these and uh, getting profit of, uh, from all of us, uh, I think that for all of that, we can use, in fact, this possibility of this new possibility of using the virtual side. But again, I think that is using the virtual side with the physical side, uh, not totally virtual side. Uh, as I said, the virtual side, purely virtual, I think that is possible in very specific cases. Um, and uh, successful. I don't say that it's not successful, but uh, I don't uh, think that it's so successful as it has been the program itself. And there are many other things that we cannot uh, go through. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, uh, adding to, to many of those aspects that are pointed out like <clears throat> uh, uh, many organizations that are, have been uh, appearing in order to reorganize the, the research, the, the studies and so on. We also uh, have a, a big issue that I think it's inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, the green agenda, the green agenda, the green agenda, and also the digital agenda. Uh, and, uh, but, but, in the digital agenda, we might consider that we discovered with all this digitalization that we got uh, deeper um, dif difference between people. Because in fact, there are those, I, I should say, the, the, the digital divide. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, I, I think that uh, there is also something very important, uh, which is empowering the entrepreneurship, uh, which can be supported by clearly this blended process mobility. Um, and uh, I, I, I consider that uh, <clears throat> we need to, to, to consider really uh, in a very deep way the, the, the uh, blended mobility. Uh, therefore, if you ask me, which is the, the A3AS uh, perspective, because it's not Elizabeth A3AS, we, yeah. uh, we should be aware of and consider the hypothesis of introducing evaluation indicators on the assessment of education programs and uh, in the institutions that should help raise awareness of the higher education institutions in Portugal. But, uh, as I said previously, we only can be persuasive, uh, do it in a persuasive way, um, according to the mission of the, the, the agency. Therefore, uh, my personal perspective is positive about the blended mobility, and I believe on it, even with uh, those aspects that can be balanced by the short periods of uh, being uh, in the right place. Uh, however, in the, the new uh, programs established by right, the community, I think there is one named uh, Blended Intensive Programs, uh, which is a program uh, dedicated for very specific 
topics with about three ECTS, for example. And uh, maybe it can be connected with micro credentials. However, what we need is to, to, to get the institutions looking at this and coming out with uh, some internal regulation uh, to solve all the, those problems, as uh, um, Katerina said as well. We, when we want to receive a student, it's not only our uh, uh, interest of receiving student, our, our uh, capacity of receiving him or her, it's also the conditions, the, the security, everything. So there is a lot of other topics that we don't remember when we are on the process. But in fact, when something is wrong, then we realize that there, there should be, have been many other uh, requirements to be fulfilled. So that's it. OK, thank you, Maria Teresa, for sharing your opinion about this. I I noticed at the beginning of your intervention the idea of the inclusion and also the green agenda because there's um, certainly a lot of downsizing the traveling and this is a very huge contribute to the, the green agenda. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Anyone can uh, add her or his opinion? Um, yes, Andrews. if I may. Uh, that please, please. Um, yes, um, just. If you give me a few minutes, I would like to also come back to, to the previous question or some, some thoughts that the colleagues uh, shared. Um, about the barriers. Yeah, but well, okay. it's, it's about the virtual and blended mobilities anyways. So. Okay, okay, okay. If you please, okay. Um, well, I, 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 I have to say I agree with most what, what was said, but as I mentioned in my, let's say, uh, opening uh, uh, remarks, um, I... I think we really need to keep in mind that when we are speaking about virtual blended mobilities, we are targeting different people than when we are speaking about physical mobilities. And this is something that goes to what Thomas said about uh, ECTS uh, limitation and, you know, that students would rather decide for physical mobilities. And I would say let them, because we also need those students that want to go on a physical mobilities. As, and now going to Erasmus program again, sorry, I'm from the agency, so I have to keep this agenda on the table. But anyways, like the funds are doubled, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll have to finance a lot of physical mobilities. So we will need those students that want to go, but we also need, and one of the horizontal priorities that was also mentioned by Maria Teresa is the inclusion. So we want to include more students, those that have work that cannot go because of the work, that have families, that have different kind of circumstances for because of which they cannot go. And 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 I think here is where where these new times of types of mobilities come come in hand. Also. Um, Yes, of course, there needs to be a lot done on, on the quality and how to implement and how to deliver this uh, content through digital way. Um, uh, assessment is one of the big questions, but also I was, I was on exchange in Canada now over 13 years ago, and we already back then had take home exam which was so basically it was done on a distance, right? And we handed it in virtually through email. So it can be done. Um, I, I'm not saying that this is the best way and the only way, but there are ways we need to find them and we need to implement them. Um, also blended mobility is the option. So they could listen to the lectures virtually and they can then physically go for those two weeks uh, and do the, the exams or assessments there uh, at the host institutions. Um, and um, how to wisely use them, I would say is, um, you know, use this physical part of blended mobility for, for reaching those goals of the physical mobility. So to meet new people, to set the connections and then continue uh, these this new partnerships, these new networks, or, or, or keep them alive virtually, because this can be done virtually. And of course, then in the meantime, in the meantime, you need to go again and visit and so on. And now going to benefits, um, so that I don't skip completely your question, I, I have Thank to you. agree with Maria Teresa, um, of course, and, and these are the main priorities of, uh, of Erasmus Plus program as well, is the inclusiveness, so the inclusion, 
the environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, in a way, this, this kind of uh, uh, mobilities can be used to keep in touch with, uh, for example, if, if I'm speaking about staff mobility with partners that you already established, that you already visited, and now you can continue this uh, mm -hmm. partnership uh, online. Thank you. Thank you, Bozida. Uh, Andrews, please, you raised your hand, so. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll try to be quick with uh, my three points that I think uh, blended or virtual mobility brings to the table. So one thing that I noticed is that um, it leads to innovation in teaching and learning. Uh, many lecturers uh, at their home universities, when they moved from physical classroom to uh, a virtual classroom, they just kept on going, uh, you know, the same way. They didn't actually reapproach their study process and look at it in a, with new eyes. And uh, when you change both of these elements, you get, you know, students from abroad and also in a virtual environment or, or a blended environment. Uh, it causes many people to look differently at how they are going to organize their study process. And of course, this is also relevant for students because they need to learn uh, other approaches to learning. Um, for example, I know quite a few professors and lecturers that use the flipped classroom approach for the first time in their lives, uh, just because they had to deal with uh, virtual mobility. Uh, another benefit is, I think, uh, that it is a very different experience. If I would say that the physical mobility is an extension of their academic experience, plus with an element of holidays and cultural exchange, uh, in many cases, especially in these BIPs, intensive uh, experiences, it's very work-like. Uh, and it's usually organized in a challenge-based approach. So instead of a usual academic experience, it looks more like an actual international project where you have to collaborate with all kinds of people and tackle on issues that you may have not even heard before. So that's another aspect I think that brings uh, a lot of value. And um, I'll just repeat inclusion as well, because I think that uh, it allows uh, people that would not consider physical mobility to use blended or virtual mobility because of, for example, their um, social uh, you know, limitations because they can't leave work, can't leave family members behind and so on. Uh, I, I do agree with the point made by, the, by our colleagues that it targets a different target group, but it still you know, expands the number of users of mobility, I would say. Okay, Andrews, thank you. Uh, anyone want, want to, wants to share his or her opinion about these three top, uh, hey. Thomas, please. Sorry, I just and then if thank you, so I just wanted to add, but I think it opens up um, ways for mobility for students with inclusiveness and uh, problems, but it also helps students just in preparation. So students, I mean, I think it, it can increase the physical mobility afterwards because then students, it's not a, such a big step, especially for young students, because then it can start online and then figure out if it's working, if they like this culture or not. And if then if they have this experience, then in the next semester. So I think that um, so there's in this sense that it's it's a more gradual uh, way to do um, mobility, and this could be also a big benefit for some students. That's just I wanted to add to that one. So in the sense, it's it's it over not only blended within one semester or within one course, but even over the whole study program that you mm -hmm. have. All right, you do the virtual one in the first few semesters and when you are a little bit more experienced, you then go back uh, do the physical one. Yes, that, that conciliation is, is very important and uh, can add value, of course. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Thomas, please. Thank you, Alberto. Alberto. Uh, a lot of things are already mentioned, but I would just want to add one point. I agree with uh, those things mentioned already. Uh, in order to establish virtual mobility, universities in Europe have to cooperate. And so looking at the points, one answer could be Athena is uh, based on virt also based partly on virtual mobility and is, is using it. And uh, so it is of course an advantage uh, to have university in, in Europe to collaborate in education, which makes our students 
better, stronger on the international market. And that's also one, one aspect uh, which we should keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We, we, we were discussing uh, a few mo moments ago the, some, some um, things that need to be more um, defined. For instance, uh, the assessments, the, the weight of the ECTS about uh, when, when we compare uh, virtual and blended to physical uh, presence and physical teaching. And my question is, what can we do to promote oh, what can we do to promote uh, um, this this kind of of uh, um, teaching mode and answer those specific questions what is the path that we need to to go to uh, have those things assessment ects and also the uh, incrementing of the, the participation of the teaching staff, because uh, it was said that this, the teaching staff is not uh, so keen until the moment about the uh, virtual and the blended mobility. So anyone can share his or her, opi or her opinion with us, please. Please Maria Teresa, thank you. Okay. I don't want to be the first, but <clears throat> um, okay. First of all, we need the regulations uh, from our institutions, and I don't know if the process are different in all countries. But we have, uh, I've been saying this different times today. We have the university autonomy. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we cannot uh, decide the rule for each one. So we have to get some uh, average situation and then uh, each one will be defining the, the rules. Um, I, I can give you an example. I, a few days ago, I was trying to, uh, to understand uh, which could I consider uh, about the uh, internship that uh, a girl from Toulouse uh, did in July with me in my lab. And uh, she was for one month uh, and uh, she has been all the day. So what they were telling me was, oh, okay, uh, for that long and with one subject, maybe we can consider, for example, two ECTS. Uh, and so I think that this was a, a new situation I was asking for, but there are, uh, in fact, uh, some kind of uh, transfer from working hours to ECTS, which is normal. And uh, these new situations have to be very clear for our institutions. So we need all those regulations, and I think that uh, uh, our institutions are now aware of these new uh, problems. Uh, but uh, from uh, my point of view, it's clear that we need better teacher qualifications in, in terms of providing the virtual side. Please, <laughs> lecture at a distance is not, uh, in fact, uh, lecturing, okay? Um, uh, so we cannot be delivering a traditional lecture and even so in traditional lecture we should be aware that nowadays the tendency is the uh, the teaching uh, centered on the student so it's not just go there and just talk about something um, <clears throat> then uh, we need also that our teachers uh, need to be recognized and we don't have nobody recognized by any kind of effort as a teacher in Portugal. <clears throat> uh, we also uh, need to improve our teachers' network, which is very important, of course. Uh, and uh, then they, they, they need to, to feel that the work, the work is, is being, in fact, recognized in some way, because uh, at least in our case, we also have the, the problem uh, of being a research element. 
and for that we have to produce uh, indicators. And so if we are needing to produce indicators in research and we don't and we don't have anything positive from the other side, but this is a, an internal problem. I mean, possibly in Portugal, I don't know. In any case, from our uh, so from our uh, agency, I think that <clears throat> uh, we need to better trace uh, of teachers, uh, of teachers' performance, uh, recog the recognition and quality when assessing education programs and the institution again. And uh, then this, uh, maybe we, with this, we can uh, raising the awareness of the higher education institutions in Portugal for some of those aspects. Uh, but again, again, uh, the, the agency just can be in a persuasive way. We can evaluate, but not uh, impose because there is no regulation. Okay, Maria Teresa, thank you. I believe that Thomas was raising his hand, so... Yeah, thank you. Please, please Thomas. Uh, uh, by looking at the universities, I think the university as a whole uh, should be willing to establish uh, virtual and blended mobility. And that means, it, so it sounds very simple, but it means uh, not only that the lecturers uh, are promoting this, uh, but also the administration, the legal department. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not only concerned to outgoing students, but also virtual incoming students. Uh, and that is, uh, that is, I think, the first important step and necessary step. If this, uh, if this is, uh, uh, let's say, a go from the complete university, then a lot of things can be done, workarounds can be found, and then there is already some kind of willing atmosphere at the university. And that is a very important thing. Then also uh, the, the lecturers uh, uh, will support this and uh, will find uh, the advantages of these things. And as, as Nuno already said, uh, within the Athena, Athena frame, we have now a, a, a common course on databases from four different universities coming uh, or collecting several hundred students all over Europe and showing uh, the different perspectives uh, at the different universities within this one course. And the students could join and uh, see how this works at other, other universities. And the important thing is the whole university needs to support this. And this is my, my message right now. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'd like very much to hear the opinion of Anna, because Anna deals directly with this uh, subject of ECTS. So can we share with us your ideas about this subject, uh, Anna, please? Um, yes. So I think it's actually more or less what Thomas already said. I think also because we have the Lisbon Treaty and everything, so actually all a lot of regulations are already there for mobility. And I saw in the chat there was a question: How much ECTS can you be uh, gain somewhere else and things? So it's more about really having a mobility culture at the whole university. So because if so, so in this sense goes back yeah, that it's normal and that it's important and it's recognized that having students in your courses from different partners or from different universities it's a normal thing that is the new normal I think and it's not something special and that's why it's as soon as there's a little bit of work and a little bit of special things to do then you say all right no I don't do it but it's the not it's the, that it's the new normal so I think it's really about the cultural change how do you want to do education is it about yes i'm just it's normal that i have two students from a different culture in my class mm -hmm. or that are they around from the student's perspective it's normal that i do some courses in a different culture and then uh and i know that this is part of the study that i have to learn how to do things in a different culture and how, that i have to learn also different competencies in, in this respect Ok, Ana, thank you. Uh, Gustavo and Catarina, I don't know if you want to add anything about this, this question. 
Well, I believe that almost uh, everything has been said. Uh, I, I fully support and second um, well, what has already been said by Thomas, by Maria Teresa, also by Anna. Uh, I believe that uh, when it comes to ECTS, we are always talking about workload. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe the issue is how to measure that workload when we're talking about virtual activities. This is something we, we have to think about. Mm -hmm. But still, uh, also, I would like to refer to higher education institutions' autonomy in terms of defining uh, uh, learning agreements, for instance, within within the within the Erasmus activities. And this means that, well, universities have have autonomy or freedom to decide whether they are or not in in conditions of accepting. Uh, certain virtual activities but this means that we need to maybe change our mindsets in terms mm -hmm. of uh, what are supposed to be uh, in uh, in distance uh, lessons or what is supposed to be a virtual activity i still would like to refer something concerning the staff training i fully support what has been said by maria Teresa. of course this is one of the main needs we we do have and uh, this is all already addressed by the Erasmus program in defining that uh, teaching training, for instance, is one of the main priorities in terms of mobility within higher education sector. And in specific, teach, uh, teacher training in terms of new pedagogical, um, uh, new pedagogical skills and also innovative uh, curricular development. So this means that we shall take this opportunity opportunity to, to uh, train our, our staff, whether we talk about teaching staff or not, uh, in uh, defining new formats, defining new um, contents and methodologies, uh, well, uh, helping us to deal with this new phenomenon, which is virtual uh, activities as a component of a blended mobility, the way I see it. Well, that's it. That's what I would like to do. Thank you, Gustavo. I believe that Andrews raised his hand, so if you please. Yeah, well, I'm no expert of, uh, you know, these uh, aspects of SCTS in mobility and such, but I wanted to take a step back and point to uh, what I think is happening here uh, due to European Universities Initiative being uh, actually active and challenging many things in higher education area. Um, we had the Bologna process for around 20 years, and it um, ended up creating a lot of tools, uh, quality assurance principles, uh, recognition uh, of, of diplomas, CTS credits, uh, even approaches to teaching and learning and such. But I think that in many cases, these tools, they have been used in a very limited sense. And what I think uh, the European University Initiative is going to bring is a way of uh, stress testing what uh, infrastructure we have built so far, because we're going to you know, innovate and create uh, varied approaches to, for example, mobility or any other thing that we were used to doing in a certain way. And uh, I think this is why uh, this initiative is very interesting, not only to the institutions themselves, the students, but also for uh, European higher education area itself, because it's going to establish and like make it or break it in a way. Yes, of course. Thank you, Andrews. I believe that Bozidar wants to add something also. Yes, thank you. Um, well, what I can say is that I can agree with uh, what most of them said. And, and going back to what Andrew said in his even previous statement, and um, and what also you uh, or um, Nuna mentioned in his uh, opening presentation and the goals of, of Athena as a European University Alliance, um, you mentioned that you know one of your goals is student-centered learning, and and this is something also connected with this virtual component of, of this. And at least in Slovenia, I believe that most of um, let's say uh, lectures are still frontal rec standard lectures which are not really student-centered ways of, of delivering the content mm -hmm. and, and we can see well we have to see this as an opportunity 
to to further develop our teachers and this is where i agree with maria uh, teresa and all the rest that mentioned this also so yes we we have to work on on the competences of of um, higher education teachers and in doing so i think that european alliances this is something that has a great potential to do so as as andreas Prisley said this is a a field where you can test all of this but not only field this is also the partnership that is already there, that it's working, and where that you can use to even, uh, uh, for example, apply for another cooperation partnership, addressing directly, uh, let's say, quality of teaching or uh, uh, training the teachers, or let's say, uh, uh, finding out the um, systematic solutions for assessment of virtual mobilities and so on. So, you know, this these partnerships that you have is really a big opportunity and of course also responsibility that where, where you can um, come up with all of these, um, let's say, good case practices that then can be implemented. Thank you, Bozida. Uh, uh, your, your last interventions opened to me a path to a question about the process that, that I would like to, to place here. Uh, some of the disadvantages that um, are, are placed about the virtual, especially the virtual, and also the blended mobility, but especially the virtual mobility, is what kind of skills can be worked in this teaching learning method and blended mobility. That's my final question. So if you please, anyone that would like to answer. Can I say a very quick thing? Uh, the, the, the big problem, you know, uh, when we went to, to teach in our schools, uh, we, on the past, because I have mm -hmm. white hair, uh, we used to go and to, to learn a little bit because we started from the, 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 the basis and uh, we had other, other uh, teachers who we were working with and so on and uh, then some of us it was my case for example because i was uh, lucky i had uh, someone uh, a dean who, who had uh, in fact a vision about uh, teaching development and so in 90s uh, and uh, up to uh, 200 2010, we had uh, many, many uh, teaching development. However, I think that uh, many of our, uh, my colleagues sim simply don't think about that because they have a lot of research to do. We have a lot of research to do. So we have no time for everything, okay? So this is the first point. Second, uh, I can assure you that last year in September 20, I designed the course with a, an American teacher because, in fact, in America, the, the distance learning is something that uh, was even then before internet. So uh, we, we designed the course. My department paid for it. I did the course in a basis of online of distance education. So I understood properly what is in distance education. But I can assure you that in my department, we are more than 70 teachers, but only 16 were enrolled in the course. So the problem is we need to understand what is distance teaching is not delivering uh, lessons. I, I have been in a lesson from a colleague of mine in which uh, he was talking during one hour in a at a 90 degrees of the camera, okay? So it's like I was with you one hour talking about six slides. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that our students uh, are not uh, able to follow anything, okay? But even so, the question, the first question is, uh, is it a lecture something like going to a room and deliver a content? No, it is not anymore. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand what to do when we are delivering topics at a distance, mm -hmm. okay? And this is my main concern because now, 
in Portugal, for example, everyone thinks that they are able to do this as education and it's not possible, okay? This is the, the point. We need to understand very well what is the technique or the methodology, the pedagogies and so on behind mm -hmm. the distance delivering of content and what is a, a course or a discipline or a credit unit, whatever, in a distance uh, learning approach. <clears throat> Thank you, Marie Therese. And, and that, that idea is uh, specifically linked to that of the training staff, training teaching staff. Uh, anyone can uh, head his or her opinion about this subject of the, what kind of skills can be worked. Uh, Bozidar, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll I'll maybe be provocative and just <laughs> um, please do say say something um, that I also shared at some other roundtable where we discussed uh, virtual uh, mobilities uh, because a lot of teachers were saying you know you can you can deliver the content but you cannot deliver the experience or the emotions and I have to disagree because I now have two examples why. So um, to be more personal, if I share with you that I also breed cats and during mm -hmm. the pandemic, we had litters, of course, because the nature calls and we had to find the new homes for these kittens. Um, since we couldn't meet people in person, we had to do the selection process, which if I might add is very you know, strict because I really want to know that my kittens are going to best possible homes. Okay. So I was doing the selection process through Zoom, so virtually, and okay. I had to meet people virtually, assess them, their temperaments, their characters, mm -hmm. and, you know, and thinking about that, a lot of companies, especially these big multinational companies, are doing virtual sele uh, uh, selection processes online for years already, and it's obviously working. This is one case, or one example. Another one is online dating. I mean, how many couples nowadays you already have that they met online and now they are married? And so it's possible to not only read the emotions, but establish emotional connection virtually. You just need to find the right way. So this is my answer okay. <laughs> to you. Thank you. Thank you for your, your interesting examples also. Uh, Gustavo, please. Uh, yes, well, following uh, Bozidar, well, I, I, I partially agree with this uh, perspective. Of course, of course, we can we can uh, we can have emotions uh, online. However, uh, when we talk about uh, the cultural experience, still we need the physical part. So I'm not in. I'm not disagreeing with Bozidar, of course, but uh, still, I would like to put us in a in a in a in a biggest dimension in terms of what the Erasmus can do among the countries and people uh, we are, uh, we, we all are in Europe. But following Maria Teresa, uh, uh, I, I, well, once again, I, I fully support, I, I believe that what we, we can have as, as, as a way of launching it is, uh, of course, we, we do have to be based on good practices we have in national terms. We only have, I believe, one uh, higher education institution that is uh, fully accredited and allowed to provide distance learning. Maybe we could uh, we could uh, learn something from them. I'm talking about uh, Universidade Aberta, as you probably know, in Portugal. Yeah. Still, we could uh, we should promote uh, peer learning. We, we we need our our staff, uh, our teaching staff, to to be more prepared prepared to review their views in terms of what can be or cannot be done when providing distance learning. I, I, I fully agree with Maria Teresa. Uh, distance learning is not, uh, is not uh, simply um, providing lessons uh, uh, on a digital basis. So uh, we need them to uh, recycle the, the way they, they they, uh, they approach their, their lectures and uh, of course we need to uh, invest in, the, in their training. Uh, still, I, I would say that we need national legislation 
uh, in terms of allowing teachers, for instance, to have more availability and to have the recognition issue uh, in terms of this uh, training that is uh, that is needed. So, uh, as Maria Teresa was saying, uh, even if a, a teacher uh, wants to uh, uh, have a, a certain training experience, whether we talk about virtual or physical one, that that takes that takes time, and, and usually uh, teachers don't have that time. So we need the special allowances, or we need some uh, uh, some sort of uh, statuses that that allow teachers to be absent uh, in in a more frequent way. If we are uh, assuming this as a strategic uh, issue to be addressed, so if we consider really that uh, our our staff teaching, our our teaching staff need needs a uh, recycling. Uh, uh, strategy uh, in terms of uh, competencies, so maybe we should review our national legislation or at least uh, the autonomy of, of institutions. And uh, well, that's it. Thank for, you for now. For now, at least. Yeah. Thank you, Gustavo. I don't know if you, anyone can add anything about these these ideas of the, the skills and the method of working those skills. Um, well, uh, uh, yes, carry opinion. on uh, what Gustavo said. In fact, we also need some kind of legislation in Portugal because the accreditation we have are not for mixed uh, situations, are for face-to-face -face situations, okay? And the, the, the one from uh, Universidade Aberta is already accredited because it's uh, filling the respective... Uh, uh, regulation for distance learning. And uh, there are different aspects that we need also uh, be aware. It's that, uh, in fact, for example, Universidade Aberta, they have just for their staff four instructional designers plus uh, technical staff for the digital media. So this is not something that uh, I decide to make, okay? Uh, this is something that I need to learn and then I need to have conditions for. Because in fact, for delivering a course in a distance approach, we need to get people knowing about that, how to deliver a course in a distance uh, approach. And as I told you, I did the course last year and I understood what is in fact a distance learning uh, strategy. I learned by myself, but I'm not able, uh, well, I'm not teaching at the present, but in any case, I will not be able to do it alone because I will need to have someone from instructional designer uh, to help me and possibly also people from the digital area. And if we go to the Portuguese law, it's all there. Okay? okay, so in fact, distance learning is not just as we are doing here. Okay, okay. Uh, and this is only a, a detail that I think we need to understand this in order to improve our performance. Okay, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not saying that I am uh, expert. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, but okay. I know what is uh, distance learning. Okay, thank you, Sorry. Maria Teresa. Uh, now it's time to thank all the, the, the brilliant interventions from the panel and to open this seminar to the questions uh, for all the audience. So now, if anyone can place his or her answer, please uh, feel free. Uh, may I take the floor for a second? I am Federico Cinque Palmi from the Italian Ministry of University and Research. Sure. Very welcome, Federico. Thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry to step in, uh, Alberto. Uh, so, Federico, um, if, if you have now the chance to share with us your opinion, then we can move for the questions after that. Well, very, very briefly, I want to just, but I don't know if you see me because I'm not familiar with that platform. So, uh, I, I see that I am online, but I don't see my image. So, I guess uh, my the person in charge for the for the management of the meeting maybe could help me, but I have no idea 
We can only on? see it a photo of yours. <laughs> Well, at least you see something of me. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you. Sorry for this a bit non tempestive intervention, but I am not in my office today. Unfortunately, I'm traveling, but I want to just take a moment uh, in order to let uh, all the participants of the meeting know that uh, uh, as Minister, as Ministry of University of Research in Italy, and in particular myself, uh, as the director of the internationalization for higher education, I am particularly keen of any meeting regarding the, the projects connected with the university alliances in Europe in this moment. I have been in effect uh, involved uh, in, the project, in the process since the first very early stages in 2016 and 17, when with Vanessa de Bias Anton, we were starting to discuss the possibility of uh, implementing uh, university alliances in order to move forward the real implementation of the, um, of the new approach of the uh, um, European Union towards uh, higher education. As you may know, higher education is not part of the treaties, so it was a real challenging uh, uh, way to proceed, but thanks God in 2017, we get the blessings of the higher education. And, um, and so we started. Well, the, 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 the Italian government believes on, on the project and I am personally still involved in the, in the advisory board of the initiative. The present challenges are mostly uh, connected with the final goal that we proposed ourselves. So having shared vision on common uh, degrees. The most challenging one, I will say, because the, the, the idea of uh, mutuate uh, a degree that is released by many different universities in many different uh, um, member state uh, and fully recognized without any procedure by other, other state members is really a challenging task. Because of course the differences between the, 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 the systems of accreditation of courses and universities are pretty, pretty different with different logicals and different approaches. But I'm really confident that we are moving in the right direction despite the differences that are part of our richness at the end of the day. So I really wish you all the best for your work. And uh, um, even if I know that my contribution at that stage is not that fundamental, I want to reassure uh, in particular Ioni Cusano, uh, but that is one of the oldest and more, uh, and more renewed uh, online universities in Italy. But in general, all the participants of this uh, initiative that Italy is strongly behind that. And uh, I'm confident that we will resolve moving towards uh, the European degree as a final goal. Thank you so much and sorry uh, to interrupt you. Thank you very much, Federico, for your intervention, your keen intervention. Um, and now it's time to uh, get on the questions, questions and answers that I was um, a few minutes ago um, uh, speaking about. So anyone who wants to place a question, please feel free. Um, I was raising my hand, Albert. I don't, I don't know if you check it or not, but if, if there is no other people willing to intervene, I'd like to have one or two questions to the audience. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, well, I have uh, two questions, if I may. One of them is, as you know, uh, we are starting to work on a a policy paper to the Commission with this topic uh, being mainly addressed. One of the things that we'd like to hear from the, 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 our invited guests is what do you think should be regulated for uh, the, the sake of blended mobility? Is it the number of ECTS as, or has already been commented uh, here in the, in the chat, the balance between the number of ECTS on physical and blended mobility? Is it the type of content that should be uh, uh, delivered through one or other model? The study fields, maybe there are some study fields where this is uh, reasonable or not. The type of classes, the type of assessment, what do you think are the main characteristics or properties that should be regulated? The other question has to do with a comment that was also on the chat from Gregory Macridis about the fact that 
the, 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 the content and the way to teach online, well, this was already discussed by other panelists also, online or face-to-face -face is different. And I believe this is more a comment than a question that the COVID has, with regards to, to, the, to raising awareness to virtual and blind mobility, COVID has good and bad sides. Because the good side is that suddenly we in one year, everybody now is free to use Zoom and Teams just like that. Uh, this was not real, at least for me, it was not a reality uh, two years ago or one and a half year ago. And now all the colleagues, all the students can use these tools very much easily. So this was, I believe, a good point. But the bad point is that the fact that we from night to day, suddenly we had to change the classes that we had from this week to next week to start teaching online. And in fact, I did that at least for the first semester when we faced this. We had no other chance except to use the same material, the same type of things that we have, and just move it online. Everything was else was, and I believe this is the negative uh, uh, aspect mm -hmm. because it brings the, the a wrong idea for for blended mobility. So in in the end, it's only one question. So what uh, do our panelists think about what really is important to regulate if we want to make a blended mobility and virtual mobility more well uh, recognized? Thank you. Okay, Nuna, thank you. Anyone, please? Yeah. And maybe I start Thomas, with uh, please, answering Nuno. Uh, thank it's, you. It's a good question, but I think uh, we should regulate as less as possible. And that means, in the end, number of ECTS, like in an Erasmus program. So then everything else is free. And uh, uh, this would help virtual mobility that would help the students to let to select things and that would be probably also in comparison to Erasmus programs uh, uh, a very good idea it, it worked already there so that makes sense on on this side and uh, regarding learning and teaching when we we have uh, noticed the same when we switched from uh, uh, physical mobility to virtual classes due to the pandemic, uh, we tried to find out how the different teachers uh, arranged their classes. And it was completely different, a huge a variety of things, very, very, very good new things, which has, um, which could not be done in, uh, in, a, in a physical classroom, but also things which, uh, well, as already mentioned, we're just uh, sitting in front of a camera and talking for one and a half hour. So, uh, but we have to, f now we have the opportunity and that's a, ch uh, that's a chance which we have to find out what ways of teaching were really good and which way should not be done. And that should be also somehow uh, formalized that this will not happen uh, on a standard virtual mobility uh, between the universities in future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, very Maria shortly. Teresa, I think we need to push our institutions to make their own regulations because if they don't do that, uh, we cannot do anything because we don't know our uh, we don't know the rules okay so <clears throat> as i told you I, I think i wrote in the the chat uh, in the big on the beginning of this conversation the discussion uh, for example the universo porto uh, knows that 30 ects are the uh, the value uh, in the past erasmus uh, plus uh, uh, framework and then they have been regulating and they have been taking uh, taking care about the CTS of many disciplines and so on so they decide that between 20 and 36 so the way uh, the, those that uh, the, they would recognize in the university of Porto. and so the other university somewhere will be in contact with each other and they know their internal regulations and then students come here, go there, and the things are recognized between the, the partners. So they have to regulate and then carry on. 
So this means that there is a new guideline for Erasmus Plus 21-27. So we have to push our institutions to regulate on, on those topics with the new mobilities and with new approaches and all this experience and so on. Okay, Maria Teresa, thank you. Uh, any more remarks about those uh, ECDS subjects? Anna, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I would even not say the number of ECTS needs to be regulated. I'm not sure. So I can think for some, I think there was one question. I think it was Thomas who said, all right, we need to, at some point you need to think, right, is it still a degree of this university if you do 90% of your uh, courses at a different university? I think that's, but that's a question more of definition now, you know, okay, then mm -hmm. or how you, I think that the, I would, go form for transparency that it's you if it's if you uh, regulate less but then it has to be transparent what the students did what they do okay. so then in this sense and, and then the other one can again um evaluate the quality i think that's the, we need only regulation for in the sense that you can measure and assess the quality of the what the students said i mean that's the main point to have regulations that you say all right I know that they did the course there and it's it's a lot of high quality and it's if it has a degree of uh now for me university of bonn and there's a uh, uh the sign of university of bonn this has a certain quality because i know they were regulated in a certain way but um i think a lot of things can be done in by increasing transparency instead of regulating okay Thank you. May Thank I, you, Anna. May I say something? Sorry. But uh, please, if I, I, I send a student for your university, for example, uh, the only way of uh, agreeing about which they, uh, he or her, has been the, doing, and then what I can give he, uh, she, or he, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the correspondence to the, the, the course, to the program in uh, my place, I need to have something to compare. Mm -hmm. When we go around in Europe, we use euros. In university, we use uh, ECTS. So the ECTS is the only way of comparing things. No, I'm sorry. So I, I, I'm completely fine with ECT, but the thing that we can say already, students can only do that and that many ECTS in mobility or something like that. Or, you know, virtual mobility can only be five ECTS and that's the maximum or 30. I think that's, I don't see that this is necessary for quality to regulate that how many ECTS a student can do in virtual reality or something. I think there's I said it's more important to have transparency that you say, all right, these were CETS, these were the learning outcomes. Now I know what the students did. And I know that there was some quality assurance system, there was some accreditation for this one. So I know what they did. Sorry to uh, if I was uh, not clear about that one. Of course, I'm a big fan of ECTS. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't like ECTS. <laughs> but but uh, as you know, the, the guideline also refer uh, different quantifications. Mm -hmm. So we have those, those average numbers, so we have to work around them. Gustavo, please. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Thank you. Well, Thank you. I, I, I believe that we are all more or less in agreement. I, I think we, we, we do agree with each other. Uh, I. I I believe that more than regulation, we need to have flexibility and autonomy from higher education institutions. But of course, higher education institutions have to be able to have this autonomy to be able to regulate uh, and define um, quality criteria, for instance, or uh, patterns or, or framework for, for what it is supposed to be a, a blended activity or a virtual mobility. So, uh, well, I, I would just share uh, that flexibility, autonomy, transparency, as Anna was saying, and also quality, quality contents and quality um, innovative formats in terms of defining what, what are we supposed to expect from a, a virtual component of a blended activity. 
but still with the uh, we not imposing as thomas and anna was were saying not, not imposing a minimum in terms of uh, the cts so that's it uh, i believe that more than regulating we need to uh, more than regulate we need to define what it is supposed to be a quality um blended experience a quality uh, virtual uh, component whether we talk about the synchronous uh, synchronous experience or a synchronous experience and uh, well, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. I, I was uh, hearing your, your, your opinions and taking account my, my role as a teacher. Uh, I think there are also uh, two, or, or maybe we can consider two more aspects about the CTS. Uh, of course, we, we all know that the CTS are linked to the workload, but we have also the kind of evidences that we ask the students to provide and also the kind of assessment that we have. And uh, if, if our mindset is only linked to the workload, I think that uh, won't be enough. It's only my opinion. And um, uh, taking in account also the, the idea of transparency and also ethical issues uh, that are linked to the, this kind of, of regulation. Uh, Teresa Nogueira, please, you raise your hand. Yes, <laughs> so well, I think I don't have too much, we don't have too much time, right? I'm, I'm trying to, to be short. So, uh, with no physical mobility, with no fun, with peers, with no international um, parties, as we, we they are going to have with this blended or virtual mobility, I believe this learning uh, style, the style of this learning system um, uh, should be a more flexible way to complete for the students to complete their their students. So my question is uh, the flex this flexibility not only about the regulations that you are talking about, much, uh, but I, I think I believe this should be about the contents to learn. So. Uh, what should be the students that choose this kind of learning or this kind of mobility? In my point of view, I believe maybe the students from the last academic years and the students from the last academic years, for sure they don't choose mathematics or physics or maybe the more specific the final contents of the course. So don't do you think this question is not specific for anyone, but um, the, the unit course that should uh, complete this studying, blending study mobility, should not be something more like general, more like um, soft unit course, uh, not that kind of unit course with so much to do, so, so much physical work, uh, physical work that should be necessary with the, 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 the teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm clear. Um, I think that the unit course that sh should be more appropriate to this system should be that final unit courses from the master courses from the second cycle. Um, otherwise, I believe the first year students will not choose <laughs> Well, if I know my students, I believe they will not choose that kind of learning system. Am I clear? I'm not, I'm not sure if I was enough clear. Yeah. What is it? Well, we know. Yes, I think so. Yeah. We know that this kind of students that choose this kind of mobility are not the same that choose the mobility or the physical mobility, as it is uh, told here, right? So we should be more spe um, specific in the unit courses to do this kind of blended mobility. Am I thinking right or, or not? Okay, uh, Teresa, thank you. Katrina, please. I think it's actually very difficult to try to narrow uh, virtual mobility into frame because we we already talked about the benefits of you know widening participation that you're reaching out to groups who have 
or two would, due to personal reasons, financial reasons, health reasons, would not opt for physical mobility. But I think there's a point to be made for flexibility that um, you know, you might have, students might have a different focus in their first or second year of a bachelor's degree, but they can nevertheless have a great takeaway from virtual mobility class. But if they were again to do uh, to engage in virtual mobility later on, let's say in the master degree phase, their takeaway might be totally different. So um, my pledge would be to make use of this flexibility and not try to narrow it down. Because I think that students, because essentially we're talking about, you know, collaborative learning online with digital literacy, with intercultural competence. And I think this is important in all phases of an edu a higher education degree. Okay, Katrina, thank you. Uh, anyone can uh, want to add anything about those ideas? Those ideas, please? No? Yeah, I think I think uh, you are right. However, uh, what we do have to be recognized. It's the only problem. Of course, of course, it is okay. So I believe, uh, Nuno, that we have already passed our finishing time. So uh, I would like to uh, really thank all the members of the panel because they all uh, made some interesting and very accurate. Uh, interventions it was a pleasure to be here with you I learned a lot and I hope that all the audience that assists this seminar also uh, add some value with all this uh, debate so uh, please Nuno the floor is yours now thank you very much uh, uh, Alberto so yes in fact we are uh, we need to finish now it was really a great uh, experience for me these two hours Thank you very much for our panelists. Thank you very much, Alberto and Ricardo, that was in the backstage supporting us. Thank you very much for all the participants that have spent the afternoon with us. From my point of view, and I believe from all the colleagues from Athena that are joining, this was a very fruitful session. It was really good to hear all these points of view. Thank you very much. Uh, we have collected also uh, all the comments in, uh, in the chat. For, uh, for the development, and I'm sure that many of the inputs that we will use for this document we are preparing uh, uh, will be born from here. So if you are interested also in uh, somehow cooperate with us in the preparation of this policy paper, feel free to email me and uh, one of us, and we will uh, put you in contact with the development. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really happy with the result of this and we'll keep in touch for sure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.